Aloha, you're listening to the NBA Big Board on the Lockdown Podcast Network. I'm back with my partner, Rafael Barlow, and we are going to talk our respective mock drafts. Both, both of us released mock drafts this week. They're not the same. We're going to have some disagreements. We're going to have some debates. Let's call this podcast Mock Draft Wars. Here we go. And we're back when you're listening to NBA Big Board. I'm with Rafael Barlow, who just joined us on our newsletter at Substack NBA Big Board as our director of scouting, full partner. Already released a couple of, of awesome uh, videos and uh, mock draft this week. I also did a mock draft this week. Um, we did that intentionally. Um, and one of the things I think that's going to benefit our readers, and if you haven't already subscribed, go over to nbabigboard.com right now. Give us your email. Um, you'll get in an inbox whenever Raphael or I, I post something. And one of the reasons to do this is, you know, look at this time. We're in, we're in February right now. We're right at the All-Star break. NBA teams are starting to form their, their opinions about guys for sure right now. Scouts are starting to feel pretty strongly. There's a body of work there for sure. But boards aren't set. A lot of boards don't get set until like right before the draft. You're going to have various opinions out there. And so what the discussion Raphael and I are going to have today is going to look a lot like a lot of NBA front offices right now where scouts don't always agree on guys or feel this guy might be better or whatever. And so don't, don't get too worked up. If we don't pick the guy that you like, uh, we're, I'm basing mine on Intel, Raphael, primarily on his scouting and the extensive scouting that he's done. Uh, we, we could be wrong. Opinions change. We still got a lot of basketball to play, workouts, medicals, combine, so much other stuff to happen right now. But I think it's a good exercise right now because I do th- feel like we know a lot and there's starting to be some trends right now. And so, um, Raphael, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to this war. Um, yeah, it, it's a war. We like each other too much for it to actually be like a, a real war. Uh, but there are some significant disagreements and and we're going to get into that today. If you want to read the mocks, go over to NBABigBoard.com. You'll have my, uh, mine was dropped on Thursday. Uh, we'll pick one through 30. Raphael did his first half on Monday, second half on Wednesday, and has a really cool video feature as well. And uh, for the next couple of weeks, Raphael's works free. It's not behind the paywall as well. So if you want to get a taste for what's happening, uh, you can go and check out his work um, as well. Follow us on Twitter. You can see that. Uh, I'm at Edge Hat Ford Insider. He's at, at Barlow500. But let's start at the top. Detroit Pistons look like they're going to have the inside track in the number one pick. All that actually means is that they have a 14% chance of winning the draft lottery. So inside track is 14%. So let's keep it in perspective about what it is. Uh, They had the number one pick last year. They take Cade Cunningham. But we're going to start with, they have the worst record in the NBA right now. And they're projected to have the worst record in the NBA right now. And so Detroit is on the board at number one. Raphael, who did you think was the Pistons should take with the number one pick, if they get the number one pick overall? Well, I feel like I kind of got set up here because I had Bancaro number one, but I have to make my case for Bancaro after Jabari Smith shoots seven out of 10 from three and scores 31 points looks, last night. Looks like Kevin Durant uh, <laughs> yeah. last night. Yeah, go go for it. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I'll just stick with what I had with Bancaro. I like the... the the pairing of him and Kate Cunningham, I think as a, a coach, whether it's Dwayne Casey or not, I think a coach can get really creative with putting them together. You could have some 4-1 pick and rolls or 5-1 pick and rolls. I, I like the fact that Van Carroll is, I think he'll be able to come in and score right away, but he is also a good passer. And I really am intrigued by what he'll be able to do in the NBA with NBA spacing as a pick and roll ball handler, because, you know, right now he's playing with Mark Williams, who doesn't space the floor. And not saying there's, there's a bunch of floor spacing in Detroit, but I think that he's going to be pretty tough to contain at 6'10", 250, getting downhill. So I like the, the, the one-two combination of Van Carroll and Cunningham. All right. That's the case for Boncaro. And I, I know a lot of people that have been listening to me think that I'm down on Boncaro and, and I actually have him fourth um, in my mock draft going to Oklahoma City Thunder, who I 
Oh, I, I love that fit there for Boncaro there. I'm not down on Boncaro. I think he is a legitimate prospect for the number one pick. The thing that actually impresses me the most about him, Raphael, you know, watching him closely is his feel for the game is really off the charts. I mean, he really sees the floor. He makes excellent decisions um, passing the basketball. I mean, I don't think he can play this in the NBA, but he's almost like a 6'10", 250-pound point guard um, in a yes. certain way. And I think that's that's something that you've sort of seen in ACC play with him. And, and that's a big that's a big deal to me. That's going to be a big deal for uh, teams as well. Having really highly intelligent basketball players who really understand and see the game is a big component. And so when you factor that in with him being 6'10", 250, uh, and being an offensive weapon the way that he's he really is a very skilled offensive weapon as far as being able to shoot the basketball, score in the paint. Um, he's especially lethal uh, when he gets around the basket. Uh, there, there's a really strong argument for for him in Detroit, as there is for Chet Holmgren uh, in Detroit. And, and I even think there's a strong argument for Jaden Ivey, and we'll talk about it in a second because I'm not sure you do. Um, but I think that there's a strong argument for Jaden Ivey um, as well as a, a, as a guy that could, could go to Detroit. And I would, I would sort of love to see him play um, in, in that environment with Cade Cunningham, but I I'm going with Jabari Smith. And, and I wrote this, um, I, I had this set up. He, he was number one on my big board uh, last time. So I, I wasn't influenced by the 31 point um, game. And, and, and actually Jabari's had a couple of weaker games recently um, as well that I think have, have scared people a little bit. So this was a bit of a, of a coming out party for him uh, just over the last few weeks in, in the way that he's played. But when I see 6'10", I think he's, he's an elite shooter. Uh, I really think that, that that is a skill that is going to translate uh, at the next level. I see his athleticism. There, there's, there's parts of his game he's really right. you got to remember he's 18 years old right now. So he still struggles to create for himself. Uh, I, I still worry a little bit about when he gets near the basket, his uh, finishing ability at the basket. Boncaro is way better um, at that. Chet Holmgren is way better um, at that. He's not an elite rim protector or necessarily an elite rebounder. He really wants to play like a three. Yeah. And and when he's trying to create for himself off the dribble, it 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 sometimes he looks like a baby deer out there. You know, he's, he's he's he doesn't have the tightest handle yet or whatever. But I love the motor. I love the confidence. I love how when he rises up, uh, he he can get that shot off against anybody. And and look, I haven't compared him throughout this draft to Kevin Durant. I think that's an unfair comparison to anybody. But watching his clips last night on Thursday night or on Tuesday or Wednesday night. He looked a bit like a Kevin Durant, um, not just in his ability to, to shoot threes. He had, I think, he was seven for ten from threes, but also that way that he elevates on the elbow, uh, and 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 that's that's kind of his second favorite place to go get shots. And he's he's really skilled there. Uh, I, I think he's I think he's going to be awesome in the NBA. He's all, the only guy that I have right now with a tier one grade. I'm not sure where you're grading the the, the other guys right now. Uh, I have everybody else kind of as a tier. The other top guys is a tier two grade. Chet's convincing, maybe going to convince me otherwise, uh, just given how strong he's been. I kind of want to see him play in the NCAA tournament, not just against uh, WCC competition over and over again. But um, that's kind of where I'm at. Why not Jabari one for you? Um, I, I like Ben Carroll as a passer. And I feel like to me, in order to be like a really effective scorer in today's NBA, you have to be a, a playmaker. And I just like the combination of playmaking and, and scoring ability and the fact that I can give him the ball on the block and he can get a basket. And I think that eventually he will be able to space the floor. He may not be a 40% shooter from, from deep, but I, I think that as a coach, you can get a little bit more creative with him and then there's a lot of talk about he may not have the same defensive upside but he's averaging close to a block and a steal per game so i think that's been a little bit overrated i think at this point people are kind of picking at him which is what we all do with you know we, we do it with all of the all these year. guys right yeah <laughs> and especially as we get closer but that's that's my reason but i will say the thing about jabbar that has really impressed me is i didn't realize he was such a good shooter on the move I didn't realize that you could – I knew that you could put him in pick-and-pop situations, but when I watched the game yesterday, they were running plays for him where he's, he's like, curling at the top of the key, shot a step-back three, and I think you can, you know, 
get easy buckets for him, but by putting him in motion, he can slide down. And again, he's a shooter. He's an elite shooter, but it's not all just standstill threes. Yeah. And, and I had mentioned it in the podcast I did for Locked On. I wasn't impressed with Jabari when I first saw his high school tape because he seemed like he was allergic to the paint. And the only thing he did was shoot threes. And yeah, if he got the ball at the elbow, it was kind of like a face up, tough, contested jumper. But he's three years ahead of where I projected him to be. I thought the player that he is now is where he would be maybe in like his second or third year. Mm. And I mean, he's he's definitely he's definitely impressed me because at one point I thought like, okay, is this guy the next Channing Fry? Because all he did was shoot threes when I saw him playing for the Atlanta Celtics. And as he's gotten stronger, you can see that the ball handling's gotten better. He may not be able to get into the low, low post, but he does have this LaMarcus Aldridge-like turnaround that he gets to when he's on the block. And, uh, and I mean, he can attack closeout. So I don't think you can go wrong with, with either player. All right. So Boncaro fans to Detroit. I know there's some Piston fans that really want to see Chet um, there as well. So let's let's talk about him. Uh, I had Boncaro four. You had him one. Let's go to Orlando Magic. Who, who are also very, very likely to end up with the same odds, 14% of getting the first round, uh, the, the first pick in the NBA draft. At number two, you actually don't take Jabari, who I actually think Orlando would take number one, by the way. I, I think Orlando would also take Jabari Smith number one, but you selected Chet Holmgren. Yeah. So make the, chase, make the case for Chet at number two to Orlando. Well, I'm just looking at Hammond's draft history. <laughs> He likes real thin, long, high upside defenders. Not saying Jabari isn't a high upside defender, but you look at Jonathan Isaac, you look at Mo Bamba. When you go back to his time in Milwaukee, he drafted Giannis. Yep. And I think that, I mean, they just pay Wendell Carter. I think Mo Bamba would be the odd man out. And I think that if you put Carter and, and Holmgren together, you could have a, a nice front court. I think that again, you can't you can't go wrong. But up until for well, actually for most of the season, Jabari was the better three point shooter. Chet was behind. Chet caught him, and then Jabari seemed to kind of slide a little bit as we got into SEC play. And you can make a case and say, of course, SEC play is a lot stronger than WCC. So that could be a, a reason why the the numbers have have changed. But I think that Chet can be this, I, mean, I don't want to overuse the term unicorn, but I think that he can also be a 40-point, three-point shooter that can protect the rim at a high rate. And I think that he's a little bit of a better passer and better at attacking closeouts and a better finisher at the rim than, than Jabari. But he's also almost a full year older. And I think that also has something to do with it too. But I'm going to go with Chet at number two. Uh, you're right. I actually think about, you look at Jeff Weltman and John Hammond and, and the, the sort of players that they like in the past. It, it, it's interesting because they did draft Mobamba to kind of do some of the same things that, that we hope Chet sort of does in the NBA, right? A, a guy who can be both a rim protector as well as a, a stretch guy. I mean, I, I don't know how many people remember, but that, you know, people talked about the fact that Mobamba, um, you know, could, play on the perimeter a bit, could shoot, shoot three shooting. Uh, by the way, Mobamba is shooting 34% from three uh, this year, uh, you know, for, for, for Orlando. And uh, he's, I won't say he's having a breakout season, his fourth year in the league, but he's having a solid season uh, yeah. for, for, the, for the magic this year. And I, I do think Chet has more upside. I think he's a more fluid offensive player. I think he's a more skilled offensive player. And I think he's a better rim protector than Mobamba is um, right now. But there, there's a lot of similarities there. And, and I kind of agree with you that, that if they draft Chet, it's kind of a signal that they're moving on from the Mobamba um, experience uh, in, in Orlando. One of the interesting things about the Magic is they, they've got young players at really every position right now. So whoever you draft, you're probably talking about somebody else moving on. Uh, yeah. as part of that, uh, I went with Jaden Ivy out of Purdue and who's moving, who's, who's moving on. <laughs> and, 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 you know, so whether that's, you know, Markel Fultz or Cole Anthony, or, um, you know, I doubt it's Jalen Suggs, uh, right now. I, I doubt he's, he's moving on. Uh, there's, there, there might be space for all of them there. 
I, I, I've been, and I said this last week on the podcast, I'm, I'm moving into the space of the opinion that I think it's going to be Jabari and, and, and Jaden Ivey. Now, now Chet's played so well in the WCC and, and Von Caro has his own case I, that I, I could end up being wrong about that. But you're talking about an elite explosive athlete, six, six, nine length. So he's going to fit again, sort of the Jeff Weltman, John Hammond. I, we love explosive long athletes. Uh, he, I think, has improved dramatically from his freshman year to his sophomore year. Even in season in Purdue, you're seeing Purdue put the ball more in his hands, allowing him to kind of initiate offense, play the point guard, and when the ball is in his hands, good things happen. Turnovers also happen. Tunnel vision off, also happens sometimes. Uh, bad shots often ha- happen sometimes, but also incredible things happen. Um, and I think when he gets more spacing in the NBA, uh he's going to pop at a different level than he's popping right now at the big 10 playing on Purdue where uh, the, the spacing is harder for him to always do what he does. He's such an aggressive finisher at the basket. I think he plays with great drive. He, he's proven to be a very capable three point shooter when he gets his feet set. Uh, he doesn't shoot it well off the bounce, which is a, an, an area of concern that I'd like to see him improve. But I, I just, when I'm like measuring upsides that, that, athleticism and skill, the athleticism and his size for his position, if he's really a, a point guard, uh, I think he could have a John Morant type career at the next level. And, and I think that's going to be very enticing for a magic team that has a lot of really good young prospects on their roster, but no one that you really pinpoint as a superstar. I'm in the NBA. I don't think that's going to be Suggs or Franz Wagner. I don't think that's really going to be Jonathan Isaac at this point or, or Markel Fultz or RJ Hampton or, uh, you know, Mo Bamba or Wendell Carter. Like there's a lot of young talent there, but they don't have that star um, to build around. And I'm not sure you build a, I'm not sure Chet is a star that you build your whole team around at the end, but I could see Jaden Ivey being that guy. Yeah, and that, you, that makes you had him six, so there was a big d- dump there, a uh, big drop, right, to six to. Yeah, I, I had him six, and I sometimes I try to do a lot of fit, and I think with Orlando's, I think it, everything you said makes sense, but it's also like a weird fit because I think that him and subs would be, uh, you know, I mean, I guess with Orlando, no matter who it is, it's going to be a weird fit. I think that Ivy's best position would be as the, the primary ball handler. The two things that do concern me is there is some tunnel vision there. Like I, I get the Ja Morant comparison because of the explosiveness and the athleticism, but Ja is a very good passer. I think he's a, a much – He's a natural point guard. Yeah, he's a natural point guard. And uh, my brother has this joke that we always – we've been saying for years that, you know, point guards are, are born. They're, they're not – Develop, and you can make some cases that that there have been. And for him, I think that he's so fast and so explosive that he doesn't have the in between game as far as being able to stop on the dime and shoot the the pull up jumper. But what I am impressed by is the fact that his three point percentage. And I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but it was close to like an 18, 19, 20 percent increase from his freshman year. So you can tell that he puts in work. But when I had him sixth, it wasn't necessarily because I'm, I'm I'm down on him. I was just looking at the teams. They got all these point guards that they just invested in or paid a lot of money to. And so I'm wondering, does, you know, a, a Thunder or the Magic, do they get rid of somebody that they just drafted or just paid? My, my answer to that would be they should. And I always go back to a number of years ago um, in Portland – when Chris Paul and Darren Williams were in the draft and they had drafted the year before Sebastian Telfair and, and they had the invest. Huh? They're <laughs> talking about, about the Blazers play. right now. Yeah. And the Blazers, the, the Blazers had that same sort of dilemma. Do we take a point guard mm-hmm. uh, who clearly in my mind, and I even think at the time from a scouting standpoint, Chris Paul and Darren Williams were both, regarded as better prospects than Sebastian Telfer, or do we get another position? They end up trading down a couple of spots. They get Martel Webster didn't work out. 
uh, you know, for, for the Blazers. But it, it's that's the classic error at the top. If you project, and I'm not saying they have to, maybe they project Cole Anthony or 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 um, Jalen Suggs to be better. But if they don't, and they think that Jaden Ivey is the best of those prospects, then you move those other guys or you find ways to fit. Orlando can't be in a space right now where they're just trying to draft that last piece of the puzzle. They're really still, in my mind, trying to draft the first piece of the puzzle because they don't have a star. Yeah, uh, and, 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 like, and until they do, they're not a championship contender. Yeah, and I feel like Sacramento did that last year. And it didn't even last a, a full season. Yeah. And they, they yeah. broke the, the guys up. And and I think Sacramento was operating under a different rationale, which is we're like a piece or two of the puzzle away uh, when they clearly weren't. Um, but they were also drafting nine, not two. Yeah. And and there's a there's a big there's a big difference there. Uh, you actually having, by the way, going six to Indiana, and I know that our Pacer fans that are listening right now will be high fiving all over the place. Uh, local kid uh, coming back to the Pacers, he actually seems like he'd be a really interesting fit in the backcourt with Tyrese Halliburton uh, in Indiana. I actually really like that fit for for Jaden Ivy. Um, of course, the Pacers might be in a position that they're going to get the number one or two pick and and be able to get there. I don't think Jaden Ivy will be there at six. Um, Raphael, at least his latest mock, does. Okay. Well, it's time to talk about Rock Auto. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, which is the only brand their warehouse happens to carry? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30 50 even 100% more for the same parts of a chain store or car dealership? Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. They have everything you could need, brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even new carpet. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck, right? Locked in, locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts you're ever, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Okay, so we disagreed right at the top, but uh, at least three of the guys we... Um, agree on, which is that out of the top four, Boncaro, Chet Holmgren, Jabari Smith, I think Jaden Ivey's there. You actually had Jalen Duren um, at four, which is interesting. Uh, I had him going uh, eight to the um, to the Spurs. But I want to talk about guys that we actually had bigger disagreements on. So let's talk about Shaden Sharp uh, for a minute. Number one kid in his class, hasn't played a minute for Kentucky. The the talk right now is that he will return to Kentucky and and play uh, what will end up being like his actual freshman year next year for Kentucky. He won't enter the draft, but there's these stories out there that he might actually be eligible for the draft based off of his high school stuff. If you're really interested in this, Kyle Tucker came on the pod a couple of weeks ago, broke it all down. He knows everything about Kentucky basketball, and there's literally an entire podcast dedicated uh, to this topic. So I'll sort of end it there. I'm cynical on this. I think it's very rare that guys that are top 10 picks decide to end up going back to school. There's not huge upside there and there's considerable downside um, that can happen. I think Shaden Sharp gets drafted somewhere between five and 10. You have him a little bit lower at 12, but even at 12, I think that Shaden Sharp probably is best served coming out. Now, the other argument and John Calipari's made it is if he can't really help this Kentucky team this year, what NBA team is he going to help next year? Uh, and, and I think that's, you know, a fair argument, uh, I guess, but th- he's a really, really talented prospect. I think next year after Scoot Henderson and, and Victor Wimbayana Mon are off the board, he's probably there at like three, uh, three, four uh, next year. Uh, in if he, if he stays in the draft this year, I have Indiana taking him at five, uh, which is a strange pick given that they went like Chris Duarte. They went with like the oldest prospect in the draft last year, and now they go youngest. But I think given the rebuild and everything that's sort of happening in Indiana right now, they don't want to stay high in the lottery. And so taking a Shaden Sharp this high is their swing, right? If they end up at fifth, this is their swing for the fences with a guy who um, would maybe be a top three pick the year after after that. You have him a little further down at 12, uh, which would be, I, I believe, to Memphis, who's getting this pick from the Lakers uh, as part of uh, what was the Anthony Davis deal years ago. Uh, why are you a little bit lower on Shaden Sharp? 
just because I haven't seen him play in college. I mean, if we go back to a podcast that we did a few months ago, we had Yannick Sosa as a top five pick. <laughs> we had so many guys from Baldwin to Peyton Watson to Caleb Houston. All of these guys were projected as lottery picks and they got to college and whether it's, you know, the, the fit at the school they went to, or they just haven't played well, we've seen their stock plummet to where I don't even have most of those guys as first rounders anymore. And I am, and we talked about this a little bit with, with Zaire Williams. I go off of what I see in, in college as opposed to what I see in high school. I don't think scouts have had the opportunity to watch him play. So they're only going to be able to watch him play in practice. And at this point, he's probably not going to do anything in workouts. So it's such a, a, a big risk or a gamble. And I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes higher, but the way I'm just looking at the guys on the board, do I take him over AJ Griffin? And I, I would say, no, I'm not going to take him, him, him over AJ Griffin. And so, um, again, I, I've just only seen the highlights from the EYBL. And it's just tough for me to take a, a guy that I've only seen highlights in EY, EYBL over someone that has been proven in, in, in college basketball. But I, I could be totally wrong. I, if I'm not mistaken, is Enos Cantor the last guy that was drafted high without really playing, like did this, the whole sit out year? Well, James Wiseman played like a yeah. total of like I I a couple Kyrie. of games for me. Uh, for yeah, Memphis. Yeah. Yeah. Kyrie. I mean, there, there's, there's been some guys um, that have went high and what I like about what Raphael is saying right now is this kind of reflects probably the exact discussion that's going to happen in war rooms right now. You're going to have the hardcore scouts and that's what Raphael's doing. He's breaking down videotape. He's scouting these guys saying, I haven't seen him play a minute of college basketball. We all liked Caleb Houston. We all liked Yannick Zosa, and then we saw them play, and we didn't like them so much anymore. Patrick Baldwin, remember that guy? Peyton Watson, like we could go through the list. But then, you know, the argument back is going to be we also liked Chet and Paulo Bancaro and Jabari Smith and AJ Griffin before the draft, too, and they're fine, right? Like, so can you go back and look at what made this guy the number one player in his class? And, and this is where the scouting gets really tough. Will it translate at the next level? Uh, it, does he have an NBA game? Uh, and from the scouts that I'm talking to, and this is where I'm basing mine more on Intel, um, mm-hmm. they think that he's going to be a, a pick in the five to five to 10 range. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, that's, that's where they think that, that, that he'll go. But there is going to be some hardcore scouts in those war rooms that are going to be throwing their hands up in there and saying, we're really passing on A.J. Griffin or Jalen Duran for, for this guy. And it'll be interesting. A.J. Griffin, by the way, um, so I had, I had Shin Sharp going to the Pacers at five. A.J. Griffin was the toughest guy for me to pass on. And one of the only reasons I did it, because uh, I think he, I actually think he's kind of my f- fifth guy on my board. Um, per se is there are some real, there is some real squeamishness from some NBA teams, given his injury history yeah. um, right now, uh, given in high school at the start of the season, he's looked fine uh, at, at Duke since he, since he got healthy or whatever. My guess is it will actually come down to the medicals of the combine and people really digging into that and seeing, okay, were these just sort of unlucky injuries or is there anything chronic here that we need to be aware of? And that may dramatically change his, his, his draft position, but it is something where I've had several scouts sort of caution me as I've been driving the AJ Griffin train for the last month, man, I'm not sure that I would fully be on board on that train until I saw his medicals. And that's, that's a big area that they're, they're holding out from because he does have an extensive injury history. Yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, this one, like you said, I love this, this debate or this, this, this war because I mean, there's so many ifs, you know, you know, with the, with even with with Sharp, you look at like you said. All right, you, you mentioned like the scouts like Chet, the scouts like Jabari, but I didn't see a guy like Blake Wesley on anyone's list, and he was not like a McDonald's All American. And him playing college basketball helped him. Now, of course, it, you know this is he wasn't as highly touted as Sharp, but 
I just be kind of scared because I look at a guy like Scott Labissier. If he would have did the same thing, there would have been some GM or coach that would have lost their job because he would have been a top five pick. And that that's what makes this tough. And that's why I guess nobody's really right until three, four years down the line. And, yeah. and that's what I enjoy most about this is you're, you're trying to project what an 18 or 19 year old is going to do with millions of dollars in their yeah. pocket. It's, it's why if you're going to be a draft analyst, you just have to make peace with the fact that you're going to be horrifically wrong <laughs> at times. And you're going to be really smart, look really smart other times. And, and some of it, frankly, just has to do with luck. Um, yeah. You know, at the end of the day, right team, right fit injuries, getting maturity. in trouble later. Yeah. <laughs> maturity, like so many other things that we're not even talking about right now. All right, so let's talk about Kendall Brown out of Baylor. Mm -hmm. You have him 15, Oklahoma City Thunder, uh, getting that pick out of, via the LA Clippers. I have him going seven to the San Antonio Spurs. And uh, this is a guy that is, you're seeing the same sort of debate in, in, in scouts' offices. Athleticism, elite. Um, switchability as a defender to defend multiple positions, um, elite. Motor, Good. Finishing at the basket. Elite. Reluctant shooter. Low usage player. Uh, are major red flags in a guy that you're drafting at seven or, or eight. A guy who's fitting into a Baylor team that is comprised largely of upperclassmen right now uh, and does supporting stuff, but is definitely not the guy. Um, at Baylor and not asked to sort of carry that load every night. And that, that makes him for a tough eval, right? Because you're at least getting to see some of these other prospects be the man on their team, be the guy that is that you're seeing under pressure every night. And then you've got the Kendall Browns of the world, kind of like Scotty Barnes. And this, this is the comp that I'm going to give before I de dump this off to you. These are the exact same concerns that we had about Scotty Barnes coming uh, into the draft, right? He came off the bench, low usage player, reluctant shooter, not a great three point shooter. Um, how do you take him at four over Jalen Suggs or, uh, you know, a number of these other guys. And then suddenly he's unleashed in Toronto and everybody's like, Oh my gosh, like this is, this was a no brainer. Uh, that's that Scotty Barnes should be there. I think that Kendall, I'm not, I'm not comparing, comparing them as prospects. Actually, they're mm -hmm. different players for sure. But I'm saying that some of those same concerns, you have to factor in the environment that the player is in. Leonard Hamilton was not just going to turn the keys over to Scotty Barnes and just let his freshman run his team. That's just not how he plays. And I think the same thing is true in Baylor. They're not going to turn the keys over to Kendall Brown. That's just not the, the situation here. And so some of that low usage uh, is in fact, in part, because he's playing within a system that his coach is asking him to play within. So you having 15 instead of seven, how come? Basically everything you said. I mean, at one point I did a, a mock on NBA Draft Junkies and I had him in the top five. And I thought, okay, as the season goes on, maybe he'll be a little bit more aggressive. And the Scotty Barnes comparison is what I'm going back to myself because when everyone talked about Scotty Barnes, around the draft time, all you heard was his intangibles as if he was going to be a role player. And that's why I, I had mentioned it during the, the live draft show. Like, are we talking about a role player here? Are we going to select the guy that high if you think he's going to be a role player? But Scotty Barnes has shown so far that he was probably being held back at Florida State, that he can be aggressive and he was a reluctant shooter. And I'm trying to like make sure I don't make the same mistake with Kendall Brown, but I can't see right now him being more aggressive. It seems like he is totally fine, you know, just scoring off cuts to the basket and 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 being set up. And so I have to think like, does he have? Has he shown flashes of being able to take over or create his own shot? And then I just look at some of the guys that are that are ahead of him. Like, even though Keegan Murray is a little bit older, I think Murray is more more aggressive. And so that's that's my biggest concern mm. is 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 he aggressive? Is he a reluctant shooter? Because I know at one point he was shooting a decent percentage. It was just on a very low volume from three. But then again, you yeah. have the same thing with with the, the other kid from Baylor, um, Sohan. You know and 
Baylor guys yeah, are going to be hard to evaluate. Yeah, they're going to be hard. Uh, I, and by the way, we actually are, I think, aligned. I actually think we both had uh, Sohan going to the Minnesota Timberwolves in our mock. Yeah. Uh, so we that was that was one where we were in total agreement. Walker Kessler was another one. We both had him going 13 um, to, to Charlotte. But Kendall Brown, I, I think this is this is where, as a scout, you earn your money, right? Because you have to project now. He what he can be and not just what he is. It's one thing for a scout to look at somebody and say, this is what he is. Right. And actually I think a lot of people who have an eye for basketball can do that first part, right? This is what he is. This is what he does. This is what he doesn't do. Um, This is what the game field shows. This is what the synergy sets stay. And then there's another scout who can say in, in the right system, in the right role, this is what he can do. And I think that that was the vision of Toronto with Scotty Barnes is, okay, don't just tell me what he did at Florida State. What could he do uh, for the Toronto Raptors? And and they saw it and they selected him over over Jalen Jalen Suggs, which was a, was a pretty controversial choice um, at the time. And the thing that's that Kendall Brown keeps coming back to me on is his mobility and explosive athletic ability uh, again, in more space in a different role in the NBA. Uh, I, I think that that, that translates more than like, I'm still wrestling with Johnny Davis and does all his, his incredibly difficult shot making, uh, that he does for Wisconsin, which he does it. And it's incredible. Does that as a, as a, you know, good, but not explosive athlete as a guy who's more of a mid range guy than a three point shooter. Does that translate at the NBA? And I actually have kind of more questions about that, even though his numbers are much better because I'm not sure what NBA team plays him in that role, uh, you know, at the next level. And then everybody's like now old DeMar DeRozan's doing it. And I'm like, okay, first of all, DeMar DeRozan wasn't doing it for years that way. Like, yes, he's in his, you know, what, 10th, 12th year. And now he's an MVP candidate, uh, you know, fair enough. And, and also there's not a lot of DeMar DeRozan's out there. Um, uh, you know, those are the sorts of questions that I think that you have to ask. And, uh, the scouts that I'm talking to that I trust, and, and there's plenty who disagree, but the ones that I, I trust who have that sort of forward vision are projecting him out and what he could be in the NBA and say that the physical tools and the feel, the sort of intelligence for the game and the feel for the game are both there. And those are potent and will overcome some of the other things that are there, but it's a fair question. Yeah. I think for him, you can say the same for any prospect, but fit is going to be really, really important. And I know in one of my mocks, I had him going to Portland, but this is when Portland still had Dame and CJ. And you slide him there, and he's fine because he's going to be a ball mover. He's going to get baskets off activity. But I think if you put him in, you know, maybe Orlando, then he's, in my opinion, he's not going to look good. Hmm. And so I think for him, he's one of the guys where I don't know if he's an exact plug-and-play guy. I think fit is going to be really, really important for him. That's why I liked him in San Antonio, by the way. I feel like San Antonio gets the most out of guys like that. Uh, and and I actually could see a use for him actually playing the four uh, for San Antonio um, is is uh, what I'm, I'm sort of envisioning um, there. All right, let's talk about a, a, one other guy. Very hyped prospect coming out of high school. Jaden Hardy uh, has put up okay numbers as far as just counting stats at in the G league, but efficiency has been awful under 40% from the field under 30% um, from three also an underwater assist to turnover ratio um, right now, but coming out, the reputation was great shooter, elite scorer, can play both backcourt positions, not a a particularly, not a bad athlete, but not a particularly explosive athlete. This isn't Jalen green, Uh, but largely regarded coming out of his high school class as the best guard in his class. Now he's sliding into the twenties on your board on other boards, you know, you're seeing him sort of slide as well. Uh, I I still got him at nine. Uh, I had him actually going to the New York Knicks, which would be a really sort of interesting um, fit. I think you had him going 21. I think that's again to Indiana uh, via, via the the Cleveland Cavaliers um, pick that they got. Oh, you had him going to Dallas. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think the concerns about Jaden Hardy are obvious. So I'm just going to sort of ask the question, do we grade him on a different curve because he's playing in the G League as opposed to playing in NCAA basketball? And would this look different if he was playing on Kansas or Duke or Kentucky or, or what have you? Would we have more patience for him? Like we're having patience for Ty Ty Washington or, or J.D. Davidson in Alabama than we do with him playing against superior competition in the G League? Well, I have another question on top of that that is a concern. How does Jalen Green's inefficient play? I mean, I saw one stat where he's like ranked as one of the worst or least efficient players in all of the NBA. I think in and the entire NBA right now, at least according to 538's Raptor score, yes. I think he's literally last. Yeah, so I think it was between him or Killian Hayes or something like that. Yeah. And I wonder how does that impact Hardy's stats? Because everybody knew that Jalen Green was by far the superior athlete. There was talk about him going number one, and he's really struggled. And Hardy is not on, at least from a prospect point of view, I don't think anybody thinks that they're on the same same level. Now, I think what had a lot of people intrigued, and it was something that you mentioned in a previous podcast, was the potential to be a lead ball handler. Now, he hasn't shown it to me because the, the, the assist numbers are lower than the, the turnovers. But then again, you know, he really hasn't had the opportunity. But from what I've seen, I don't see primary ball handler mm. in, in this game. I see him. He's definitely someone that can create his own shot. He, he's definitely a, a, he has the the skills to create his own shot, but it's the efficiency. He, along with Johnny Davis, to me, are guys that it seems like their game is suited for the 2000 era NBA, where isolation basketball, tough shots, and inefficiency weren't <laughs> you know they weren't like major talking points. Even though Hardy does shoot threes. But I think like he got a reputation as this great shooter because he shot NBA threes with such ease. I think he's more of a scorer than a shooter. And I think mm. those guys are really hard to project in today's NBA mm. unless you're like a great athlete. Right. He, he's tough. Well, <laughs> yeah, he's a, t- he's a tough eval. And, and again, the G League experiment is in its second year. So it's not always clear because you can use the example you made. Well, Jalen green looked better, but now he looks awful in Houston, but Jonathan Kaminga looked worse than Jalen green in the G league. And now everybody's like, how did this guy last until seven? And he's in the warriors rotation on like maybe the second best team in the NBA right now. And he's earned that rotation from all the accounts from the coaches and everybody else. They, this isn't just throwing rookie in minutes. They they actually expecting Jonathan Kaminga to come out there and help them win basketball games every night. And and he's looked really good. Uh, and and so man, you know, I, I don't know that the G League's taught us anything yet uh, oh, no, exactly. about those two because they're very conflicting. So maybe take the guy who has the worst stats, and that guy will be better in the NBA. You know, like you know, what is that going to look like? Um, I, I think the G League's just a tough eval. We don't have enough of a track record yet to really know what it means uh, because it's a big jump. And I think this is at least fair to say to go from high school basketball to playing in the G league. It's a big jump to go to college basketball at a major program, but it is a bigger leap. And I think you do have to give them a little bit more time to adjust. And I do think Jaden Hardy has been better in the second half of the season than he has been in the first half of the season, which is at least somewhat encouraging to me um, that, that maybe he's getting his act together. Yeah. I okay. Mean, I- I was just going to say that the G League is tough because on one hand, I feel like it's set up for the guys to succeed. It's not about winning or losing. It's we, in, order, in order for the program to continue, they're going to need the guys to succeed. And I thought Isaiah Todd was there last year. I thought he was really good. And so now when I compare Michael Foster to Isaiah Todd, who's not really getting minutes in the Wizards rotation, it just – it just makes it tough. And then we don't even know who they're going to have in their class for next year. It, it's But but if Isaiah Todd had been drafted by the Thunder, maybe he would be getting a lot of minutes. I mean, it's yeah. it's I, it's so hard to know what that yeah. even means. Yeah, yeah. it's it's it all, it's it's a tough eval. 
is, is basically what we're, we're saying right now. And, and, uh, and so the nine to 21 is probably a very accurate look at what he's all over the board, uh, for, yep. for different teams. All right. Let's talk about our longtime sponsor, Built Bar. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bar is delicious. So if you want to eat healthy and it just feels like it's boring, and by week three, you're like thinking to yourself, this is just not worth it. Where's the chocolate? Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, 17 grams of protein. And when you compare that to a candy bar, which usually has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, dozens of net carbs, these things are delicious. They have great flavors. They really do. I'm not, not exaggerating here. They taste like a candy bar. They're chewy. They're not chalky. Um, and they're just something that you can eat as a snack and, and as a healthy snack, which is just so much better um, than a candy bar. And so look, there's so many great flavors to uh, choose from. Coconut, coconut almond, peanut butter, brownie, raspberry, cookies and cream, salted caramel, mint brownie, many more. Uh, my favorite is the car- the coconut. It tastes like a mounds bar, uh, that sort of moist and chewy. Um, Built Bar is also always coming out with new flavors, uh, including limited time flavors. So go over to Built.com to see what's new. And so here's our offer. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Okay, we're wrapping up. Going to talk about a few other guys. Uh, we're now we're going to go to even a tougher eval than the G League. Let's go over to the overtime elite and let's talk about Gene Montero, uh, who is the real draft prospecty guy um, playing over an overtime elite right now. He's just kind of sat on my big board all year, at like fifteen. And and I'm just going to be honest. It's kind of like in talking to guys, it's like splitting the difference, right? Like he might be ten, he might be twenty. Let's sit him at fifteen. Um, I find it was also really hard to get stats from overtime elite or whatever. I finally contacted them. They sent me the stats and it was kind of like a good news, bad news thing for Montero. Um, the point guard question, there were some, some signals pointing his way, almost a two to one assist to turnover ratio. Um, looked like a lead ball handler was making assists. What have you? His steal rate was exceptional. He's rebounding the ball. Great for a guard 26% from three, which is almost exactly what he shot, uh, in Spain, um, the year before little guards that aren't super explosive athletically that are shooting 26 from three, that becomes a little bit of a harder sell. You have him going 11, Mm -hmm. uh, in the, in your mock, I had him all the way at 27. So I actually dropped him. And in part, it is based off sort of a growing sense of questions that are now starting to build around him. I think he's going to be one of the hardest guys to pay because I think workouts are going to make a massive, massive difference in his his draft profile at the end. The teams are going to want to see him go up against the top NCAA prospects in workouts. Um, but you, you seem to be high on him. Why do you have him at 11? Yeah, I he's someone that I've seen in person. And I mean, I haven't seen him in person in a couple of years, but it was at the basketball out borders all-star weekend 2020 and of course he's not going to pop out and pass the eye test he's not going to you know make highlight real plays as far as being like super explosive but in this particular setting i thought he was the best player there and josh giddy was was at this was at this camp now it is going to be tough because over time elite is like you said it's even tougher to gauge than than the G League because he's going up against high school guys. But I still see Montero as a shot maker that just finds ways to put the ball in the basket. And I I do think long term, he's going to be more of a Lou Williams type guy that's going to play a long time as opposed to being like your franchise point guard. Um, But New York needs a point guard. I don't know if he's the answer there, but I, I just like Montero. And I think that um, in the workout, I don't even know. I, mean, I think he's with clutch and I could see him as a guy that doesn't even do any workouts against competition. I could just see him doing the, the pro day at clutch. And if his stock is, is kind of like set at a certain range, then I can see them just kind of holding him out. All right. So you have him right now, at uh, going 11 to the Knicks, that would be Knicks fans would be, I think, super, <laughs> super interested in that, uh, in, in that choice. 
Uh, I have him going 27, which is obviously uh, significantly lower. Um, I just had a hard time placing him when I got kind of into the back back half of the draft. That that 27 isn't based off any in, in information, but I have him going to Miami, um, which uh, is another sort of interesting um, fit uh, for him. Let's move on to J.D. Davis in Alabama, a guy that I, I had in my, you know, in the bottom half of the lottery uh, until really recently. And it seems to me like scouts have cooled off on him a little bit, feel like maybe he needs to come back for another year. Explosive athlete, uh, interesting passer, lead ball handler, very turnover prone, hasn't shot the ball particularly well. Has an interesting situation too, where he's playing behind veteran guards, and so he he often is coming off the bench, but he does get minutes and he does have a significant role on this team, and he's had a few big games that have gotten scouts interested. You have him fourteen uh, uh, to the Atlanta Hawks. I had him all the way at twenty nine to the Golden State Warriors. Why uh, why J D Davidson in the lottery? Swing it for the upside on. I mean, yes, he's an explosive athlete, but I think that he does other things well. He rebounds, he passes the ball, he's getting about, what, four assists a game coming off the bench. And I know he's wired to score, and this role for him is a little different than he's used to. I mean, I guess you can say that for everybody, but I think that he's someone with his speed and his aggressiveness will look a lot better with NBA spacing. He has the ability to get downhill, make plays above the rim, and I think he can fill the stat sheet. So I'm swinging for the fences, and I think the shooting will come along. But I I just think that he has has all the tools that NBA teams are looking for as far as a guy that can shift the defense. I'll actually confess that I kind of like him. I, I if it was me, I'd probably have him about where you're having him. It seems like teams have cooled on him a little bit, but there's so many prospects that we could talk about right now that are freshmen that whether that's Bryce McGowan's or Max Christie or Peyton Watson or um, Patrick Baldwin uh, or Caleb Houston, uh, we could keep going on around these prospects. They're just kind of all over the board and teams don't really sort of know what to do with them. Uh, uh, Kennedy Chandler, I think it's going to be interesting to see whether that athleticism uh, and what clearly looks like he has lead guard potential will play out and they'll look at some of the mistakes he made. He made a big transition. He wasn't in a big time high school program. And so it was, it was a, again, a big leap, I think for him and talent level to go to Alabama and play at Alabama. Uh, But there, if you want to go find highlight film of JD Davidson to, to make your argument for a lottery pick, it's there. It's absolutely there. And if you want to put together a horror sh- show as well with J.D. Davidson, you can also put that together, um, especially his sort of carelessness um, with the ball. All right. Let's go to your uh, our big surprise. The one big surprise that we had, each of us had one in our mock that uh, I think people would say, wow, I think Raphael's frankly was a little bit bigger wow than mine um, was. But with a 30th pick in the draft, uh, which would go to the Oklahoma City Thunder, um, if I'm correct, uh, as part of a deal that they would have gotten from the Phoenix Suns. Who is your 30th pick in the draft, Rafael Barlow? I have Ryan Rollins from Toledo. And I actually went to watch him play before I went to Europe. And I think this guy is like this, your typical late bloomer, He's only 19, he's a sophomore. He's the same age as some of the one and done freshmen. Very smooth game, good athlete, scores on three levels. And I just see loads and loads of potential. He rebounds the ball at a high rate. And I I think that he's someone that could come in and surprise people. And so I, I think that there's not a huge gap between picks 15 through 35. And I think that he's someone that I would swing for the fences on because, again, he's the same age as a lot of the guys, scores at three levels. Yes, it's it's a, a mid-major, but I think the the, pro, the way he, he projects to me, and I think he's on the right trajectory because he's such a late bloomer. Not a lot of people have heard of him, but I like what I see. Uh, really interesting. One of the things I love about Raphael, I, you know, I do this, but – it was like, oh man, I got to watch more tape on this guy. I'm not that familiar um, with him. And that drove me right to the tape, which is like 
what Raphael's there there to do. He's he's out looking under rocks, and that's what scouts are um, out doing right now. And it was interesting. I had a couple of NBA guys that were like commenting to me on your mock with that guy. Oh, that's a guy we we kind of like. We'd never really necessarily thought about him as a first round, but now his name's out there. Let you know. Let's see um, if he blows up. Uh, mine was a, a guy that several of the scouts I really trust said, you know, look, this guy is better than you think he is. That's Orlando Robinson out of Fresno State. Actually flirted with the draft last year. Went played okay uh, in the sort of G League showcase, but didn't do enough to really generate serious interest and and to withdrew from the da- draft and came back. Having a big year at Fresno State again, a little bit younger for his class at 21. Again, a score at three levels at seven foot with a seven to four wingspan, um, can shoot the three, can score around the basket, not an elite rim protector, not an elite rebounder, but he really sort of pops in his skill level um, when you're watching him play. And I, I think he could be, uh, again, a, a player that could sneak into the back half of the first round uh, after the Mark Williams and the Walker Kesslers are off the board. Um, there's a lot of things to like about his game. And especially when you're just watching, watching the tape on him, he's one of those guys that's an eye test guy that really just kind of starts to pop. I actually ended up having him going to the San Antonio Spurs, uh, at, I believe 23 or 24, um, in my makeover of their front court, they have three picks in the first round. And I was, I was really trying to, trying to give them, give them some, some uh, upgrades, uh, in their front court, given how guard heavy and wing heavy, uh, the San Antonio Spurs are. Um, right now. Uh, what do you think about Orlando Robinson? Yeah, well, one, the Spurs are starting Doug McDermott at the four. <laughs> so yeah. I think they could use some of the help that you've given them in, in your mock. I liked Orlando. The thing that stood out to me was he's a good passer. I saw him make some pretty impressive live dribble uh, reads. The concern is he's a little mechanical, a little stiff in a sense. I wonder, can he defend out in space? He can put the ball on the floor, but it's more so he's not changing directions when he when he does put the ball on the floor, but skilled back to the basket score. And when you see the film, the thing that really pops out is he's a legit seven-footer. I mean, I haven't seen him in person, but he looks like he could even be bigger than seven-foot unless all the guys in, in this conference are really small. But the size stood out, the shooting, and, you know, a lot of times with – a lot of the centers in this draft, they don't really have a lot of game with their back to the basket. And one of the things that Robinson does have is he has like a go-to move and he has a couple counter moves. Whether or not he'll get post touches in the NBA, it depends. But I like to see bigs have something in their bag just in case you have switches and to be able to attack switches. And he's someone that I think you can give him the ball on on the block and he can make something happen. And then if he's a passer, that, that makes him even more dangerous. I like the activity he gets to the foul line. But it's the it's the shooting. If the shooting is consistent, then I think that he has a really good chance to, to sneak in the first round. He's Rafael Barlow. You can now find him over at NBA Big Board where he's going to be publishing several times a week. If you haven't had a chance, go over and subscribe. NBA Big Board, you want to see his mock draft, all 30 picks, two posts on Monday and Wednesday. Also a cool video feature um, where he breaks all that down. And you can go see my mock draft, which dropped on Thursday. My second mock draft, Mock Draft 2.0, dropped as well. Mine based a little bit more on intel and what I'm hearing around the league. Um, We think that together they they provide a great sort of overview of a lot of guys there. And there's there's several other kind of sleepers that that sneak into Rafael mind uh, first rounds as well. So to hear the whole thing, go over to NBABigBoard.com and uh, and subscribe today. And Rafael, thanks for coming on the show. And we'll do it again soon. I, I can't wait. This was fun. All right. You've been listening to Chad Ford's NBA Big Board on the Lockdown Podcast Network. Aloha.